economic strength and growth from a, for a wide variety of reasons. Inherent in this dynamics of capitalism is an overwhelming drive to earn profits, to reinvest those profits, to innovate, and thus to grow the economy, typically at exponential rates, with the result that the capitalist era has in fact been an era of exponential economic expansion. As my friend and distinguished uh, economist William Baumol wrote recently, the capitalist economy can usefully be viewed as a machine whose primary product is economic growth. The key features of capitalism, as they are constituted today, work together to produce an economic and political reality that is highly destructive of the environment. An unquestioning society-wide commitment to economic growth at essentially any cost, a powerful corporate interest whose overriding objective is to grow by generating profit, including the profit that they make from avoiding the environmental costs that they create, the continuing profit-driven investment in technologies which were originally designed uh, with little or no attention to the environment, markets that systematically fail to recognize environmental costs unless corrected by government, and government that is subservient to corporate interest and the growth imperative, a rampant consumerism spurred by sophisticated advertising and marketing, and economic activity now so large in scale that its, that its impacts alter the fundamental biogeochemical operation of our planet. All of these things combine into this system of political economy that we call today's capitalism, and it's a system that is undermining the ability of the planet to support life. We live in a world where economic growth is generally seen as both beneficent and necessary, the more the better, where past growth has now brought, up, brought us to a perilous state environmentally, where we are poised for unprecedented increments of growth, where this growth is proceeding with wildly wrong market signals, including prices that don't incorporate environmental cost or reflect the needs of future generations, where a failed politics has not meaningfully corrected the market's obliviousness to environmental needs, and where there is no hidden hand or inherent mechanism adequate to correct these destructive tendencies. So right now, one can only conclude that growth and the environment are at loggerheads, are in collision, and the engine of this growth is modern capitalism, or perhaps better, a variety of capitalisms. We've created, in effect, a huge economic machine that's profoundly committed to profits and to growth, and almost totally indifferent to nature and society. Uh, if we leave this system uncorrected, it's an inherently ruthless, rapacious system, and it's up to us acting mainly through government as citizens to inject values of, of social justice, of concern for the future, and environmental sustainability into this system. But mainly we fail at this task because our politics are too enfeebled and our governments are increasingly in the hands of powerful economic interests and concentrations of great wealth. So if we reflect on this, we have to ask, where do people like me and those of you who have been part of the environmental movement for the past few decades, where do we fit into this picture? Mainstream environmentalism has worked within the system. It concentrates on raising public awareness, forming interesting and responsive policy proposals, lobbying for their adoption and litigating for their enforcement. And we've now run a 40-year experiment on whether this mainstream environmentalism, which I have certainly been a part of, whether it works. And the results are now in. The full burden of managing this accumulation of environmental threats and addressing the powerful forces 
of modern capitalism driving those threats has fallen on the environmental community, both those in government and, and those outside. But the burden is too great. The system of modern capitalism as it operates today will grow in size and complexity and will generate ever larger environmental consequences. They have thus far tended to outstrip efforts to cope with them and there's no reason to believe that that's going to change. Indeed, the system will work to undermine efforts that we try to make and to constrain them within narrow limits. So mainstream environmentalists like myself have worked within the system, but the truth is that that puts off limits major efforts to correct many of the underlying drivers of deterioration. And working within the system, in the end, is not going to succeed when what we really need is transformative change in the system itself. We environmentalists have been, in effect, trying to swim upstream. The mental model that we've had is that we would get stronger and more sophisticated and better swimmers and be able to buck this current. But the truth is that we're swimming in a very strange river because as we get stronger, so does the system that we're trying to control. And the current gets swifter and more treacherous and we're drifting away. So my conclusion, come to with considerable uh, reluctance, I might add, is that most environmental deterioration today is the result of systemic failures of capitalism, the capitalism that we have today, and that long-term solutions have got to seek transformative changes in the key features of this system. The fundamental question thus becomes transforming capitalism as we know it. Can that be done? If so, how can it be done? And if it can't, what then? Well, I think the good news is that there are a large number of prescriptions that have been offered to take the economy and environment off collision course and to transform economic activity into something benign and restorative. Most important of these prescriptions, though, uh, lie beyond the traditional environmental agenda. So what's, what do we need to do? Well, first, I think we have truly got to commit to transforming the way that markets work. We have truly got to embrace the polluter pays principle and insist that prices in our economy accurately reflect the full environmental cost. Prices for many, many things need to go up. The average price level in the economy needs to be higher. We shouldn't deceive ourselves or the public about that. We need environmentally honest prices uh, where misguided subsidies are eliminated and market failures are corrected. We need prices that reflect the full environmental loss involved with production and prices that steer economic activity away from these losses. And second, we need to also insist that the laws and the incentives and the governing structures and the behavior under which, uh, which determine the way that corporations uh, act and perform uh, today, that that be transformed. Uh, and we, in, in one major prescription in this area is that we move away from shareholder primacy to stakeholder primacy in corporate life. The corporation that would emerge from this transformation would be much different and far more public spirited. But what I really want to focus on with you this morning is a different and even more controversial area than those two. And that is the need to challenge economic growth, our growth fetish, and the runaway consumerism on which it depends. Two-thirds of spending in our economies is consumption. In my view, the new environmentalism 
has got to challenge this overriding primacy accorded economic growth. The never-ending drive to grow the economy can undermine families and jobs and communities and the environment, our sense of place and continuity, even our mental health, because in the end it's always said that somehow we'll be better off with better lives. But there's now good evidence that that's just not so, at least in our well-to-do countries. It turns out that what we have in our affluent countries might be called uneconomic growth, where if we could somehow add up all of the costs of additional increments of growth, all of the social costs, all of the environmental costs, we would find that it outweighed the benefits. In part because we have many studies now coming from the field of positive psychology, uh, which show us plainly that increased income doesn't lead to greater satisfaction and happiness in our lives. In the end, I think what has to be modified is the overriding commitment to aggregate economic growth, mere GDP growth, growth that's consuming environmental and social capital, which are both now in short supply. In the affluent countries, we need instead to think seriously about the move to a post-growth society where working life, the natural environment, our communities and the public sector are no longer sacrificed routinely merely to push up GDP. For example, consider the number of steps that we could take in our societies that would uh, both slow growth and improve well-being. My list uh, would include allocation of more time uh, to leisure, uh, including a shorter work week and longer vacations. Let's hear it for the French on that. Um, <laughs> greater labor protections and job security and benefits. Restrictions on advertising. New ground rules for corporations. Strong social and environmental positions, uh, provisions in trade agreements. Rigorous environmental and consumer protection, including climate protection. Greater economic and social equality, including a genuinely progressive uh, taxation for the rich and greater income support for the poor. Major spending on public sector services and environmental amenities. And initiatives to address population growth. But a post-growth society need not be a stagnant one. Uh, it should include dynamic initiatives that recognize the real sources uh, of human well-being. And I think that mere GDP growth is a poor, even counterproductive way to think about gener generating solutions to our social needs. We have had enormous economic growth in recent decades, and during that period, the social needs, certainly in the United States, have mounted, uh, income inequality has grown, and, uh, and, and we have more social difficulties uh, today. Whatever we might want to do with a growth dividend, we're certainly not applying it to our environmental and social uh, needs. So I think the pursuit of growth can even deflect us away and has deflected us away from the real problems. How many times have you heard, I certainly have heard many times, that if we aren't growing rapidly, we will have to face the redistribution problem? Well, friends, I think it's time that we did face the redistribution problem in our societies. What we need to do is to address our social needs directly with compassion and with generosity. There's a whole world of policies that we need to be pursuing more vigorously, uh, measures that could strengthen our families and our communities and address the breakdown of social connectedness in our society, measures that guarantee, guarantee good, well-paying jobs, including green-collar jobs, measures that provide for universal health care, and alleviate the devastating effects of mental illness. 
measures that ensure that everyone gets a good education, measures that provide care and companionship for the chronically ill and incapacitated, measures that recognize our responsibility to the fully half of humanity that still live in poverty. These policies are wise in their own right, I submit, but we've also got to come to see these social objectives as environmental objectives because this is the alternative path that we should be on. It's a key part of the alternative path that we should be on, uh, getting off of the path that we're on today. But if you raise these social issues in the councils of most of the U.S. environmental organizations today, you will be told, well, that's nice, Gus, but those aren't environmental issues. I think that misses the point. We'll never get much environmental progress when half of the families are nickel and dime and barely getting by. I think if you add up all the proposals that I discussed in my book and, and which I, some of which I've reviewed here with you, we would undoubtedly slow uh, the growth of GDP uh, considerably. Over time, perhaps the economy would have evolved to a steady state where declining labor force and shorter work hours uh, were offset by rising productivity. But as uh, Lord Keynes and that wonderful American, uh, <laughs> Canadian, you know better than I, John Kenneth Galbraith and many others uh, have noted, that wouldn't be the end of the world to have a steady state. As John Stuart Mill noted long ago, there would still be as much scope as ever for all kinds of mental culture and moral and social progress and much, much room for improving the art of living and much more likelihood of it being improved. But we shouldn't think of this discussion or this challenge to growth as something extraordinary. It may be extraordinary at this political moment, but we have a long string of our greatest economists who have looked forward positively to the day when we could get off of this treadmill. A parallel objective has got to be to move beyond our runaway consumerism and our hyperventilating lifestyles. In the modern environmental era, there's been far too little emphasis on consumption. That situation is changing a bit today, but still most mainstream environmentalists have not wanted to suggest that the positions that they urge uh, would require significant lifestyle changes. It's another issue like the growth issue which has been given a political immunity even by the environmental community for the most part. This reluctance to challenge consumption directly has been a big mistake, I submit. Uh, particularly if you consider the affluence and the extravagance and the wastefulness that are so apparent in our everyday life. Since the first Earth Day in 1970, electricity consumption per capita in the U.S. per capita has gone up 70 percent. Solid waste generation per capita has gone up 33 percent. The homes and the lots on which they sit uh, have gotten 50% or more larger in this period. Yet even with these larger homes and larger lots, they're too small to accommodate all our accumulating possessions. One result of this has been the emergence of the self-storage industry. Um, it didn't begin until the 1970s but it has grown so rapidly that its buildings, if you could pull them together, uh, would now cover the entire island of Manhattan and the entire city of San Francisco in the U.S. I will look forward to the Canadian version of that statistic. Uh, so we have this disease, this affluenza, and uh, we need a speedy recovery uh, from it. Well, the good news is that more and more people sense that at some level uh, there's a great misdirection uh, in, in life's energy. 
We focus too much of our lives on material things, on getting and spending, and, and we know that at some level we're slighting the things that make life truly worthwhile, and that's borne out again in our statistics. Uh, we sense, I think, that we are hollowing out whole areas of life, of individual and social autonomy, and of nature, and that if we don't wake up, if we don't wake up soon, we're going to lose the chance to return, to reclaim ourselves, our neglected society, our battered world, uh, because if we're not more careful, there won't be anything to return to. We sense that possibility, I think, and we shudder. In the U.S., at least uh, when people aspire to their best thoughts in some recent polls, we get answers like this. 83% of those in the U.S. say that society is not focused on the right priorities. 81% say America is too focused on getting and spending. 88% say America is too materialistic. If these numbers are even half right, there's a powerful base on which to build. And in the bookstores that we see, uh, the shelves are full of books about how to take back your life, how to cope with spiritual hunger in an age of plenty, how to overcome nature deficit disorder. We have uh, two programs about education in our schools. One is the No Child Left Behind program that administration has promoted, but we also have a No Child Left Inside program in a number of our states. <coughs> These books tell us also how to live more simply and more slowly, and on the internet there are dozens of websites that tell us how to live with greater environmental soundness, how to downshift, what we can do to save the planet and stop global warming. Psychological studies that I've mentioned a couple of times show us that materialism is toxic to happiness and that more and more income and possessions don't lead to lasting gains in one sense of well-being or one satisfaction with, our, with life. And that what does make us happy are warm personal relationships, the closer the better, and giving rather than getting. So, here's a revolutionary new product that's trying to make its way in the marketplace. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing is guaranteed not to put you in further debt. Uh, it's 100% non-toxic, sweatshop free, zero waste, doesn't contribute to global warming, it's family friendly, and very fun and creative. <laughs> this is a true story. The young women who were trying to sell nothing in the shopping mall were arrested. <laughs> <laughs> there are many people who are now trying to fight back against this consumerism and commercialization of everything. They're trying to invite us to a new style of life and a new struggle. They're saying to us, uh, confront consumption, practice sufficiency, create social environments where overconsumption is viewed as silly and wasteful and ostentatious, create commercial free zones, buy local, eat slow food, simplify your life, downshift. It's not going to be easy for many of us, uh, but it's important. And if one thing that can change quickly, and we've seen it happen so many times, is can changes, can changes in consumer behavior. Well, throughout the talk so far, I've tried to identify some of the changes that are going to be needed to sustain natural and human communities. Most of these prescriptions are difficult uh, and far-reaching by today's standards. So we've got to ask what circumstances might make such impossible things become possible, perhaps even inevitable. If I had to guess, I think that uh, three likely drivers of, of real change are going to be, uh, first, the upwelling of a powerful grassroots movement led by young people, 
and religious organizations, and initially spurred by the climate issue, but growing to embrace a broad spectrum of environmental and community and social justice uh, causes. Secondly, we can look to the proliferation of small innovative departures that break the mold. Uh, different forms of ownership and management. Uh, experiments like those discussed in William Greider's book, The Soul of Capitalism, and Gar Alperovitz's book, Beyond Capitalism. And third, I think the driver is going to be, a key driver is going to be a crisis, or at least, hopefully, a sense of imminent crisis, an anticipation of crisis. I've never agreed too much with Milton Friedman, but I believe he had it right when he said that only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. So I best hope then, I think, for promoting the kind of changes that I've been discussing would be a, a mounting sense of uh, imminent crisis occurring at a time of wise leadership in our governments. Uh, you sound doubtful. Uh, <laughs> Uh, wait till November. <laughs> we need also at those things happening at a time when our leaders are able to articulate a new story, a new narrative uh, that draws on the best of our traditions but looks to the future, the future that we've got to build occurring also at a time when this social movement that I referred to earlier is coming forward and gaining in strength and where the landscape is increasingly populated with these small experiments of doing it the right way and where we're using the best techniques of social marketing that we've used to address drunk driving and smoking and AIDS and other, other issues. Fundamentally, to drive real change I think we're going to need a new environmental politics. It's certainly true in the U.S. Well, what I hope will happen is that the environmentalists will join uh, with social progressives who are addressing in the U.S. the crisis of inequality, which is now unraveling our social fabric and indeed undermining our democracy. It's a crisis of soaring executive pay huge incomes increasingly concentrated for a small minority, all this occurring simultaneously with poverty near a 30-year high, stagnant wages despite rising productivity, declining social mobility and opportunity, record levels of people without health insurance, failing schools, increasing job insecurity, swelling jails, shrinking safety nets, and the longest work hours uh, of all the rich countries. So America today has this problem of vast social insecurity where about half the country is just getting by. It's hard to promote environmental goals of great importance uh, in such a context. People are scared for their futures and can be easily swayed from those goals. We environmentalists have also got to join with those seeking to reform our politics and strengthen democracy. I mentioned early this gaping social and economic inequality in the U.S. Well, it poses a grave threat to democracy. America's senior political scientist, uh, Robert Dahl, wrote recently that he thinks it's highly plausible that powerful international and domestic forces could push us towards an irreversible level of political inequality, a level so great that it impairs our present democratic institutions, so impairs our present democratic institutions as to render the ideals of democracy and political equality virtually irrelevant. What we are seeing, in effect, is the emergence of a vicious circle. These income disparities shift political access and influence to the wealthy constituencies and large businesses, and that in turn further imperils the potential of the democratic process to correct the growing income disparities. 
So I think the following should be thought of as environmental goals. Public finance of elections, regulation of lobbying, nonpartisan redistricting of the congressional districts in the U.S., easy voter registration, doing away with our insane electoral college process. Fundamentally, we've got to sharply reduce the power of corporations in our political process. We've known for a long time that corporations were the principal economic actors in our system. But what we're now seeing is that corporations are the principal political actors also. And neither environment nor society, people are going to fare as well as they should under a system that you know, is almost a corptocracy. So the, my point of departure today was the momentous environmental challenges. But as I worked through these issues over the past few years, I, I came to see that today's environmental reality is linked powerfully with other realities, including our growing social inequality and the neglect and erosion of democratic governance and popular control. So my conclusion is that we've got to mobilize our political and, and spiritual resources on all these fronts for transformative change in all these areas. So let me try to summarize this in, in one paragraph. We've created a very large and rapidly growing economic machine. It cares profoundly about profits and growth, and it cares about society and the natural world in which it operates, mainly to the extent that it's required to do so. So it's up to us to inject these human and, and natural values into this system. And government is the primary vehicle we have for accomplishing this. That's our job as citizens. But we mainly fail at this because our politics are too weak and the resistance of vested interest is too strong. And in this context, our best hope for a real change is a fusion of those concerned about environment, with those concerned about social justice and fairness, and those concerned about building strong political democracy. The fusion of these into one powerful progressive force. We've got to remember that we're all communities of shared fate. And right now, we're all in the same boat. We will always be in the same boat. We'll rise or fall together. George Bernard Shaw famously said that all progress depends on not being reasonable. And I think it's time for a heavy dose of civic unreasonableness. And to the students here at McGill and elsewhere, I, I will say this to you. This is your world. Uh, help us take it back. Get active. Get activists before it's too late. If there is a period in recent memory to look for guidance, I think it's the 1960s and the Civil Rights Movement. People struggled, people took risks, and after 40 years, I think it's time to get back in the footsteps of Dr. King. There's too much stake, at stake uh, to sit on the sidelines or leave it to the environmentalist. The green shift that you tried here in the last campaign is still urgently needed, is still important. Either it or a powerful cap and trade, cap and auction program is vital in both our countries. Don't let it die. I've mentioned that the story is important, the narrative is important. So in the end, I, here's our story as I see it. Our tribe is journeying down a path between two worlds. We are fast approaching a place where there's a fork in this path. We got to this fork through a long history dominated by two great struggles. The struggle against scarcity and the struggle to subdue nature. To win in these struggles, we created a powerful technology and forged an organization of economy and society 
to deploy that technology extensively and rapidly and, if need be, ruthlessly. And we succeeded in subduing nature and creating wealth far beyond our forefathers' imaginings. So successful were these systems and accomplishments that we became swept up in them, mesmerized by them, captivated, even addicted. And so we continued pell-mell ahead, ever grander, ever larger, ever richer, doing what made good sense once, but now no longer does. There were warning signs along the way, but we didn't take notice of them, or at least we didn't heed them. These signs were all about the need to change our values and to develop a new consciousness. They said things like being, not having, giving, not getting, needs, not wants, better, not richer, community, not individual, other, not self, connected, not separate, part of nature, not apart from nature, dependent, not transcendent. The cultural historian Thomas Berry and your own Peter Brown have written beautifully, written beautifully uh, about the need for this awakening to a new consciousness. But alas, we ignored these warnings to the point that as we now approach that fork ahead, we are perilously close to losing the most precious things of all. Now beyond that fork, down either one of the paths, is the end of the world as we have known it. One path beyond the fork continues us on our current trajectory. Presidential science advisor Jack Gibbons used to say with a smile that if we don't change correct direction, we're going to end up where we're headed. <laughs> and right now, the sad fact is that we're headed towards a ruined planet. Well, that's one way the world as we know it could end, down that path and into the abyss. But there is another path, and it leads to a bridge, a bridge across that abyss. The place where the path forks will inevitably be the site of another great struggle. It's a struggle that we have to win, even though we cannot yet clearly see what lies beyond the bridge. Yet in that struggle and in the crossing that will surely follow, we are carried forward by hope, a simple hope, that a better world is possible and that we can build it. Another world is not only possible, she is on her way, said Aaron Dowdy Roy on a quiet day I can hear her breathing. Thank you. Dr. Speth, I've been asked to give an appreciation of your talk and a brief thanks from the university. My name is Martin Grant. I'm the Dean of Science. You provided a devastating critique of the world as it is and a hopeful prescription for the future based on uh, two, uh, two main elements, environmentalism and social justice. It's been a fascinating and instructive hour. I'd like to thank you. Dr. Speth is uh, willing to answer some questions, and I understand there will be a microphone in the somewhat dark region of the uh, room over there. <coughs> Dr. Uh, Dean Speth, thank you so much for your uh, 
trenchant analysis and uh, uh, extraordinarily persuasive uh, prescriptions. Um, affluenza, I suppose, occasionally gives us uh, a cold, but now it seems to have brought us into the emergency ward. And um, I wondered how you saw the relationship between the current real crisis of capitalism, that is to say the crisis of financial markets, and uh, the need to redesign, as uh, the leaders of the European Union are suggesting, our, our banking system uh, and uh, regulatory arrangements and uh, the problems of, uh, of our environment. On the one hand, it would look as if, precisely in a moment of, uh, of capitalism being in crisis, that we see the environment as a kind of luxury good and have put it aside, cast aside the green shift, cast aside our uh, concerns about um, uh, the, the, uh, climate change in order to focus now on getting back to growth. Um, I wonder if we can use this very moment of crisis and capitalism to suggest that the reorientation of the institutions we have must be away from growth and how you, how you can see that working. Thank you. Uh, that was a very good question, particularly at this, uh, this moment. Uh, I, uh, I think that, you know, we know that crises can be the occasion and frequently are the only occasion for a major change. It doesn't mean the change has to be good. Uh, and that's the struggle that we're in right now. Uh, for example, one can make a list, uh, and I actually have seven, uh, of very positive things that could come out of this uh, financial crisis. Uh, you mentioned you know, in the U.S., we've lived for decades now with Ronald Reagan's uh, final, uh, you know, famous statement that, you know, government is not the solution to your problems, government is the problem. And Grover Norquist, the leader of our uh, neo neoconservative community, you know, is, is famous for saying that their objective is to shrink government down to the point that it's uh, so small it can be drowned in the bathtub. And that's what we've been living with, uh, certainly uh, in, in the U.S. Um, maybe you have your own Canadian version of that, hopefully not as extreme. But goodness knows if we learn anything from this financial crisis, it's the centrality of government to protecting us in the future and long-term values and the desperate need for regulation. And it's not just needed in the financial sector. Uh, it needed to protect consumers in many, many contexts uh, uh, from, you know, and, and, and needed desperately to protect uh, the environment. And nothing more desperate than the need for action uh, on climate. Uh, so that's one of a large number of things that, uh, that uh, could happen. Um, I mentioned the link with uh, the economic uh, injustices uh, and environmental uh, progress. And, you know, this crisis should bring to the fore, it should rekindle a, a populism in, in people that, uh, uh, that is disdainful uh, and, and rejecting of these enormous concentrations of wealth and enormous uh, salaries and, 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 and should lead to uh, a, a more concerted effort to, to deal with the social pressures uh, that most, uh, the economic uh, inequities and, and pressures that, that most of the public uh, uh, live with. Um, and if we're going to have responsible government that's trying to, to deal with these issues, uh, we're going to need a better politics uh, to lead, uh, lead that government. Uh, so those are one, a few of some of the really important things that could happen, uh, positive things that could happen, the silver linings, if you will, on the crisis. But, um, but there are other things that, that could also uh, carry the day. Uh, you know, if the only goal among governments is to return to the status quo ante, um, and, and in the meanwhile, there's nothing we can do about the climate issue because the economy is already hurting too badly, uh, if, if, that's, if that was become, you know, what happens as a result of this, then, you know, we lose ground uh, tremendously. And it's, it's sad to see Europe, which we've counted on for leadership on the climate issue, while our countries have, uh, at least at the national or federal levels, have stagnated. Um, well, we've looked to Europe, and now many in Europe, hopefully not a majority, 
are uh, citing this uh, economic crisis as a reason to defer the EU goal of reducing greenhouse gases by 20 percent by 2020. A really great goal. So we have to fight. We have a fight. This is a struggle. How do we make something positive come out uh, of this crisis? Yeah. Uh, well, thanks, Dean Speth, for a very uh, uh, entertaining and interesting talk. I'd, uh, you've painted in very broad strokes uh, a compelling portrait of where we need to go. Um, I wonder if you could, well, the thing is, a lot of captains of industry and industrialists and capitalists, we all know, don't take kindly to being lectured to on, on moral grounds. I wonder if you could provide a specific example of a conflict uh, between economic growth and, and uh, you know, stewardship of the environment that illustrates the concepts that you're, that you're discussing. A, a specific example uh, from, you know, a, a sort of a case study well, that would help to... Let me just mention two just things real quick that are both part of the climate issue. You know, George Bush comes into office, he announces in the campaign that he's going to support uh, action on, on climate. And he, one of his first acts was to undermine his head of EPA by announcing that he was not going to support the Kyoto Protocol. And, uh, and the reason offered was that's going to hurt the economy. So this routine trumping of, and now we've gotten to the point that we've delayed action on climate for so long that it's an emergency. It's now proper to refer to it as a climate emergency. We've known about this problem solidly for 30 years. And we did so little in that time. We wasted the time that we could have done non-urgent things uh, and started the process in a sensible way. Uh, but now we face an emergency. And, uh, but we find that even in the face of the risk of ruining the planet, we find people arguing that we can't do the things that we should do to save the planet because it might hurt the economy. Now, can you imagine anything more insane than that? Because uh, we really are on the cusp of, of losing, uh, you know, moving to a different world, a different planet. Um, now, we've known about this a long time. Um, could we show the video? Is my uh, audio visual? We're going to skip all. We, we could, you know, we could go through some of this. 1958, 50 years ago. Extremely dangerous questions. Because with our present knowledge, we have no idea what would happen. Even now, man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. Due to our release through factories and automobiles every year of more than six billion tons of carbon dioxide, which helps air absorb heat from the sun, our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. This is bad. Well, it's been calculated a few degrees rise in the Earth's temperature would melt the polar ice caps. And if this happens, an inland sea would fill a good portion of the Mississippi Valley. Tourists in glass-bottomed boats would be viewing the drowned towers of Miami through 150 feet of tropical water. Foreign weather were not only dealing with forces of a far greater variety than even the atomic physicist encounters, but with life itself. Amazing, huh? <laughs> that was Frank Capra and Frank Baxter. Those of you who are my age may remember Frank Baxter did all kinds of educational uh, things on early TV, which is where that, uh, and, in, and, and in theaters, uh, which is where that was uh, shown. 30 years ago in the Carter administration, uh, we released three reports, uh, one of them calling for capping greenhouse gases at um, no more than 50% above pre-industrial levels. 
Well, we're approaching that right now, and it, we, it's going to be, um, it's going to be, you know, almost impossible to achieve that objective because we haven't started. So I, I go back and revisit this history because it underlines uh, that what happens when we're all not vigilant enough and active and activist uh, enough, uh, and it's going to be very hard to to drive these changes uh, that we need to save climate. Uh, and it's it, and it's another example of this uh, you know so-called trade-off. But now we it's not a trade-off. It's a total loss if we don't do what we need uh, to do. Yes, sir. Doctor Smith, uh, sorry. Thank you for your insights. Um, I wonder though if you could tell us some ideas on how we can eradicate or weaken certain stumbling blocks that seem to prevent this transformation that you're suggesting. Firstly, uh, those in the psychological sciences tend to tell us that people continue their behavior, even dysfunctional behavior, if there's an immediate payoff. Secondly, the political scientists tell us that nobody ever wins elections preaching sacrifice. And thirdly, the biologists tell us that crises often lead to the destruction of the weakest. And since there are many people in today's world who believe the world is overpopulated, they say maybe that's not such a bad thing. So it seems to me that these three stumbling blocks, payoff, sacrifice, and the question of the weakest, are preventing the kind of change that you're suggesting. How do we change and remove these things? Well, of course, you know that's the wonderful question, and it's a difficult, these are difficult issues. In, in my book and in raising these issues with you today, the last thing in the world I want to suggest is that I have all the answers. Uh, I merely want to open up these issues to legitimate discourse and, and to have and to bring them into our uh, political and environmental discourse and to begin a, a process. Um, and. Uh, but it was good to see, you mentioned the sacrifice issue, it was good to see, uh, so I think a remarkable moment in a way, just a little smidgen, but there was Sec Senator Obama in the last debate saying, you know, talking to the American people, looking straight at people and saying, you know, we've been uh, living beyond our means. And, uh, and we are going to, you know, beginning to have a discussion about sacrifice, about change, about a different lifestyle. Uh, we don't know where that will lead. Obviously, he's not going to go where I go uh, on this right now, or maybe ever, but uh, um, we also need to be very vigilant that, uh, you know, one of the realistic possibilities uh, of uh, a series of cascading uh, crises, including environmental ones, is is, is what the scenario builders call fortress world. It's the walling out of uh, the underprivileged uh, and concentrating uh, the wealth of the rich on, on, on the rich and trying to survive that way. Uh, we see signs of fortress world in our gated communities, uh, in our private uh, uh, police and military forces and other things of that type. Um, but. Um, it's, it's going to be, you know, extremely important that, uh, that we approach these issues with enormous uh, caring and, and generosity uh, for those who are, uh, are the underprivileged and the weak uh, and the poorly served by, by our system. Um, and um, I, I can't do more than I did in my talk to try to describe the set of circumstances that I think could lead uh, to some real breakthroughs, both politically and in terms of changing, changing minds. And I, I hesitate to repeat that, but I think if, you, if, you, if we really see a moment when there's a powerful sense of imminent crisis, we have wise leadership, we use social marketing, there's a growing and, and increasingly powerful social movement pushing these issues to the fore. Uh, and we are articulating a, a new story, uh, a new narrative about our past and our future. 
I mean, I could see that coming together and, and overcoming the difficulties that you, that you mentioned. Thank you. Um, my question relates to an organization or international organizations that encapsulate some of the values that you've talked about this morning. Are there conferences or seminars or groups of individuals that are taking some of these issues and acting on them in a serious way? I, I, my concern is that the corporate world may be running the show not only in Canada and the United States but also in many other countries around the world. I, what I've been doing since I wrote the book is to, um, is to try to identify uh, communities that are working on each of the issues that, that I discuss uh, in the book. And, um, and I'm, you know, I'm finding more and more people uh, working uh, uh, on, on these issues. Um, and uh, for example, uh, this whole idea of, uh, of re rethinking what the corporation should be all about and beginning to build some political uh, uh, momentum for the idea uh, of, uh, of, of rechartering uh, corporations and things of this type. There's a wonderful group that works out of Boston called Corporation 2020. And they are, they've been uh, having conferences and meetings and developing uh, these, these ideas. Uh, obviously, the, you know, the consumer, there are parts of the consumer movement which are you know, even far more um, advanced and uh, meet regularly. Uh, there's this group in the U.S. called the Center for a New American Dream. Um, in terms of political organizing, uh, I'm working with a group called uh, One Sky in the U.S., which is trying to use the climate issue to mobilize a grassroots movement in our country in all congressional districts. So just to mention a few things, uh, there are a lot of student activities going on. Uh, so I think, um, yes, that there, in each of the areas that I talk about here and in the book, uh, there are communities beginning to form. And of course, one that I didn't mention at all, it, 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 but perhaps should, um, and it may be sort of too radical for some, but I kind of like it. Um, and, and that's this World Social Forum, which meets regularly in uh, Porto Alegre uh, in Brazil, which brings together a really uh, uh, a movement of movements uh, of people that are concerned about social justice and environment from all over the world. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's left-leaning. Uh, and, but, um, but it's remarkable how many uh, organizations there are uh, that are working on these issues. Uh, there's a wonderful book by uh, Paul Hawken uh, called Blessed Unrest, uh, in which uh, he uh, collects information, really, about uh, the extraordinary number of organizations, which he thinks might be as many as one to two million uh, that are working uh, on these issues uh, around the world. So a lot of this is invisible. It's certainly poorly covered in, in our press, uh, but there's a lot going on out there. And uh, details of those are available in your book, are they? Um, are the ones you just alluded to? Like, so, there's or, a lot more in the book uh, than I've talked about, absolutely. And, uh, and I've learned since I wrote the book that there are a lot of things that I don't talk about in the book. But one of the things I hope to do in the future is to begin to to pull those together. But take a look at Paul Hawkins' book, too. I think that's quite interesting. Thank you. Uh, we have only time for one more question, which is my question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was fascinated, actually, by, uh, by your exposition on the role of social justice and essentially the left in environmentalism. But one of the elements of the left, one of my personal favorite elements, is the element of innovation and creativity that comes from liberalism and the left, which is so well expressed in the university environment in terms of uh, the creati creativity of students and professors uh, starting their lives essentially here, uh, especially scientific creativity. How do you see uh, the role of innovation and creativity in uh, addressing uh, uh, the impending crises that, you, uh, that you're brought to light? Well, I'll be very brief. Uh, I think, you know, look, we, creativity, uh, 
uh, we need to invent, uh, in, in the mega sense, in the largest sense, we need to invent uh, a, a non-socialist alternative to today's capitalism. And, and that is going to have to be a creative act of, of the first order. And it's got to be, you know, put together, to come together out of uh, millions of, of creative uh, acts and, and millions of, of innovations. Uh, and I see it in, in my school. I know you must uh, see, it, see it here. Uh, and so, uh, for example, uh, a group of our students uh, are trying to create this uh, micro-philanthropy initiative uh, where people, just people, uh, can go to a website uh, and support, uh, you know, vetted and, and approved uh, community development projects that bring together social justice and environmental concerns at the community level. And there are, you know, hundreds of these projects. And, uh, and, and so it's a way of, of mobilizing you know, the modest resources that these initiatives uh, need uh, around in the U.S. and, and do it in Canada, too. One of many, many sort of creative, uh, uh, innovative things that, that need to be done. Uh, Dr. Smith will be available upstairs for uh, signing uh, copies of his most recent book. And I'd like to take the opportunity now with everybody else here to thank him again for a wonderful talk. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bruce Dobby. I'm president of the McGill Alumni Association. And on behalf of the Alumni Association, the BD Memorial Lectures, and I'm sure everybody here, I'd like to thank Dr. Speth for a most fascinating lecture. Um, he, he made the analogy to a fork in the road, and uh, I think he's given us greater insight onto which fork to take. We've got to be careful, though, because you have to remember the uh, famous uh, American uh, philosopher, uh, Yogi Berra, who said, when you reach a fork in the road, you should take it. So, uh, please accept this uh, token of our appreciation. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the BD Memorial Committee for organizing another amazing event today and the Homecoming Committee for their continued support and sponsorship. Finally, I'd like to thank all of you for coming today. Uh, I'd like you to uh, be sure you take advantage of all the other homecoming activities, including um, the many sporting events up at the, uh, up the hill, including that uh, titanic confrontation between the McGill Redmond and the uh, University of Montreal. There are still seats available, okay? Uh, there are tours of the campus. There's a full slate of classes without quizzes, and uh, there's um, uh, two more concerts at the Schultz School of Music. And uh, once again, uh, merci encore une fois de votre présence et bonne fin de semaine. Thank you.